Thank you for always uh, giving us a home in your church. I had asked Father Nicarius if he would be kind enough to allow us to have the lecture in the church since I hope and pray that the book itself and the lecture and any questions that they might stimulate are all connected to our life of Christ. Orthodox theology comes through lived experience and prayer and Eucharist. And so it's appropriate for us to, but it's still a privilege, to have uh, this kind of discussion in the church itself and in such a beautiful church. By the way, I hope all of you from St. Elias don't stop calling me a Buna Maxine. I find it actually very endearing and very beautiful. So, a few words about the book. I thought that I ought not to summarize it. And that is not some kind of a ruse to get you to buy it. it it's actually to keep you awake and make sure that you're uh, enjoying the discussion because I initially wrote, undertook this manuscript as a doctoral dissertation. Doctoral dissertations are not always the most interesting read, and when you go to turn them into a book, you have to rewrite them at least partially. Usually the first part has to be completely rewritten because in a doctoral dissertation you're spending pages and pages telling people what not only what you are going to talk about, but what you're not going to talk about. And uh, in a book you don't need to, to spend pages and pages explaining to people what you're not going to talk about because they find it odd. So I, I had to rewrite the, the first part, rewrite the conclusion, go through the, the whole manuscript again, I was assisted by, I wanted to mention, three Orthodox theologians who, uh, after, as I was going through the manuscript, they went through every page. They were very patient and uh, helped me, reviewed it. It's what one calls in the academic world a peer-reviewed work, and it was, in fact, uh, definitely peer-reviewed by three very capable Orthodox theologians. If you look at the cover, you're going to guess who they might be. If you look inside the book and at the back cover, and I'm very grateful to them. Very grateful also to the publisher, because this is a British publisher. And they're a very well-known British publisher, of mostly of Christian books. They publish the books of Metropolitan Anthony Bloom, who I'm sure you would know because of his wonderful books on prayer. But they really, not every publisher these days will, I'll put it, be very honest about it, are interested in any book that isn't going to make them a big profit. And especially since the pandemic, I always thought, naively it seems, that during the pandemic people had more time to read. Evidently it was not the case. A lot of well-known publishers almost went bankrupt during the pandemic. It seems like people were more interested in renovating their houses during the, the pandemic or doing things like that, buying cottages or whatever, and reading books. So I'm very grateful to Darton Longman and Todd for, for uh, taking the manuscript on. It was especially significant because Metropolitan John Zizoulis' first book in English was published by them first in the UK, Being as Communion, that's a book that you may recognize. And it was published first in the UK by Darton Longman and Todd. Well, I'll leave those kinds of details aside unless you want to ask about them later. I'll ask Father if he wouldn't mind if we had questions and hopefully some, some answers towards the end of my talk. Let's get right into it without going through 
all of the usual niceties that one would have at the beginning of a dissertation or even at the beginning of a book. Let's talk about the title and what it's all about and really get to the center of it immediately. You see that the, the whole discussion is about asceticism and about the Eucharist. And perhaps you already know what both of these are, but you might wonder why one would write a book about it and why even there are any questions being asked about it. It is actually, for those of you who are interested, a very hot topic in Orthodox dogmatic theology right now. Many, dis I'll talk about this in a few minutes, but it is uh, receiving a lot of airtime academically, if I could put it that way. But let's talk about it from a spiritual point of view, because all theology not only should come out of prayer, but it should connect directly to the spiritual life. It doesn't connect directly to the spiritual life. It's not really orthodox theology. And hopefully this is orthodox theology. That was the whole idea. Asceticism is the practice of a spiritual discipline. Of course, it comes from the Greek word asceticism. However, this practice of a spiritual discipline is usually done on a personal basis. There are exceptions. We're about to enter Great Lent, and in Great Lent we practice asceticism together. So any kind of a spiritual discipline, that could be fasting, that could be praying regularly, having a prayer rule, and more monastic practices, keeping vigil, where you are praying partway through the night or all the way through the night. I like to say that asceticism for us, just really means keeping the Lord's commandments. If you keep all the Lord's commandments, you are practicing asceticism very well and very effectively. So asceticism can be something as simple as, but also as profound as, forgiving someone who has wounded you and forgiving quickly. That's asceticism. It involves a spiritual discipline. You are not so much putting down your emotions, but you're setting them aside for a moment in order to do the right thing, in order to be obedient to Christ. So I wanted to put asceticism in a certain context right away so that you wouldn't think that we're just talking about what Orthodox monks and nuns do. This is a discussion about what all Orthodox Christians do. I would point out that it's actually a discussion about what all Christians should be doing, but I think we can identify it very quickly in the Orthodox tradition especially. So, for the moment, I'll leave asceticism aside. We'll come back to it. The Eucharist, the Divine Liturgy. Well, one would think, why do you even have to talk about this anymore? It's all obvious to us. We experience the Divine Liturgy every Sunday and on great feast days, maybe more often in certain churches, but the Eucharist is a gift to the Church. It is the meal in which the Church becomes most fully itself, but it is something that we always do together. There are even canons in the Orthodox Church that require that we do the Divine Liturgy together. If, for example, I don't think Father Nectarios, given the size of his parish, would ever encounter this problem. But supposing there were a terrible snowstorm and no parishioners could make it to church. Well, Father Nectarios has parishioners in his house right next door, so he would never have this challenge, meet this challenge. But hypothetically, if the priest came to the church alone on a Sunday, he couldn't serve the liturgy. People say, oh, it's an interesting rule, I don't need to know about it, that's a, prob a problem for priests. But you know what, we don't have canons in the Orthodox Church that don't have a theology. We don't have rules. It's actually not a rule. It's practice that reflects Orthodox theology that the Eucharist is something we do together. There has to be at least one other person. Someone like Father Nectarios would be a fabulous cantor. 
So he could serve the liturgy and he could sing all of the responses as Father Nicholas could. But he can't. Neither can I. Because of the insistence, the requirement that we only celebrate the Eucharist as church. So there's a deeper thing going on here. This is something we only can do together. The church will celebrate the Eucharist. And the church is not the priest alone or the people alone. It's the whole people of God. So what we have now is something that more often than not we do personally or individually and something that we must always do together. And these two things have to be linked. You would think it's not a big deal to link them, and it isn't if one simply lives the life. But at the same time, many questions were raised about it in the history of the church. How do we put the personal and the corporate together in our own spiritual lives? And how have Orthodox theologians been reflecting on this topic for the past 75 years, roughly since the end of the Second World War? And that's what you would see in the book, which, by the way, you don't need to buy. I just simply want to talk about it this evening so that you know a little bit what is in it. So why Metropolitan John Sizuris? Why him? He, by the way, just fell asleep in the Lord almost exactly a year ago. So he lived to a ripe old age, and he kept writing and responding even in his late eighties. He was still responding to people who had critiqued him, still writing war, still appearing at conferences, a bright and active theological mind right till the end. He was a very well-known theologian in the Orthodox Church, a noted ecclesiologist, that is someone who specializes in the history and theology of the Church. He was a well-known dogmatic theologian. He taught the theology of the Orthodox Church at several universities in Europe. He was very well known in the Orthodox Roman Catholic dialogue, so he was very well known for relating to other Christians. He was very well known for his contributions to the Orthodox understanding of ecology. See, he was very well known in many areas. He championed the primacy of the Eucharist, that the Eucharist is the main event of the Christian life, the main one, and he put his main emphasis on that. He had many very important and very beautiful observations, things to say, many of which formed me very deeply. And when I ended up teaching theology, I took an awful lot from him when I was asked to teach a particular course at St. Paul University, which was theological synthesis. I took one of his books and I used it as a main text because it is so well written and really shows how synthesis should be done. However, one always has to, even with brilliant theologians, ask the question, is their particular presentation completely balanced? It's not to criticize a person, it's what we do in, or what they do in academic circles. <laughs> I see myself still as being a parish priest, so I didn't include myself. On rare occasion, what we do in academic circles. To ask whether the presentation has really covered all the bases. Is it balanced? Is it the way it should be? Or does it need to be developed more? I had taken the position that his position needed to be developed more, that it was very insightful, but that a greater balance needed to be, to be brought into its particular articulation. That was one of the things that I did in the book, is that I presented all of his strong points, but also gave a, what I hope was a very charitable and uh, very respectful, because I do have a lot of respect for him, critique. I'll just note in passing that this whole discussion about how we relate the corporate to the personal 
prayer to the Eucharist, asceticism to the Divine Liturgy, was being tackled by noted Orthodox theologians before Metropolitan John Zizoulis made the topic very famous in Europe, North America, and in general outside of Greece. He was born and raised in Greece, and in his doctoral dissertation, which was very influential, was later translated into French and English. But here are a few key names. I can't really spend any time talking about them because I don't think you want me to. You don't want to be here all evening, but some big names, Father Nicholas, Father Nikolai Afanasyev, who is really, in many respects, the grandfather of Orthodox Eucharistic ecclesiology, that's what this particular school of thought is called. And, and Afanasyev, who was a married priest and writing before and during the Second World War, was a brilliant theologian and many of the basic, basic facets or precepts of Orthodox uh, Eucharistic ecclesiology were really set down by him. The famous Vladimir Lossky, very famous Orthodox theologian, well worth reading, by the way, wrote a book which is, I'm sure everyone who studied theology here, not just the clergy, but everyone, you couldn't have made it through your studies without reading something from Vladimir Lossky in, in whatever language has been translated into many languages. Died very, very young, by the way, and still produced in his really short life some brilliant brilliant um, writings. Paul Yevdokimov, who really started writing theology very late in life, was really more specialized in literature, comparative literature, particularly French and Russian literature. He wrote on this topic. This is an Orthodox theologian not many people know, but you're missing something if you don't know him. A very profound thinker and a very spiritual man, a real monk. Archbishop Basil, people say Krivoshein, Krivoshein, who was a wonderful Orthodox theologian and fabulous knowledge of the Fathers and of patristic Greek, and still the Bishop of the Diocese in Western Europe. If you have a chance to read him, he is very well worth reading and wrote wonderful memoirs, but he provides us with some of the best material on St. Sidney, the new theologian, whom he knew extremely well. He writes about the balance, the, necessary, the balance that is necessary between the personal and the corporate. And last but not least, Father Domingo Stanigoye, a wonderful Romanian Orthodox theologian and confessor of the faith a true confessor of the faith. He spent a number of years in prison in Romania just because of who he was, really. Sad comment on the reality. Anyway, also a, a married priest, brilliant, brilliant theologian. And I discovered a little known talk that he gave when the then Romanian government under Ceausescu let him out of Romania for a short period of time. They used to let him out for measured periods of time. He was restricted in what he could say. But he gave an absolutely fabulous retreat in French is more comfortable in French than he was in English. In the UK, at an Anglican convent. And someone took the trouble of translating it into English and publishing it. No one was talking about it. And I discovered it and I enjoy everything he writes and wish I could read it all in Romanian. But this was in English, so I grabbed it and I discovered an absolute jewel, absolute jewel. And I took that retreat lecture and basically unpacked what he has to say. 
about the connection between the Eucharist and inner prayer. It is profoundly beautiful and made it a section in the book. He really had the whole thing described and the problem solved, if there is any problem to be solved, right there. But nobody was really talking much about it. If I could do a little thing and simply bring what he did to the fore, it would be my privilege. So the latter demonstrated, Father Dimitro, the relationship between the two very beautifully. He drew from the Philokalia to discuss the altar of the heart. He linked prayer and Eucharist in a beautiful, beautiful way. Again, I don't have the time to really talk about all of the details, but it really is something quite, quite uh, profound to read what he, he wrote. And shows how he was both a marvelous pastor and a brilliant theologian. Then, of course, the fathers of the church talked about this. Saint Maximus, the confessor, who in his great, great piece on the Eucharist, on the divine liturgy, the mystagogy, he gives us a beautiful presentation of the Eucharist in very profound terms. Yet he also provides us an, an ascetical, an ascetic interpretation of it. So he unites the two on a very deep level. We have St. Simeon, the new theologian, devoted to the Eucharist, writes beautiful things about the Eucharist, but also talks about how we need to approach the Eucharist, how we need to be prepared through prayer, through asceticism, how we need to see the Eucharist not with our physical eyes, but, but with the eyes of the heart that are described by the word in Greek, nous, through the eyes of the heart, sometimes translated as mind, but maybe better translated as eyes of the heart or the heart's faculty of spiritual awareness. And of course, St. Gregory Palamas, the master who combines the two in a beautiful and powerful way, talking about the Eucharist in many of his beautiful homilies, but also talking about the importance of prayer and the importance of ascetic preparation for the Eucharist, not just for us to fully experience it, but also for us to guard the grace that we've received once we've received the Lord in the Eucharist. I discussed these three fathers in detail. There were three theologians writing during the lifetime of Metropolitan John Cisulus who were interacting with him, more than these three actually. Father Alexander Schmemann, who was known certainly as a supporter of Eucharistic ecclesiology, Metropolitan Yerapiorotheos Vlachos, Metropolitan of Nafhaktos, uh, still alive, still writing, I'll say with a smile, somewhat less of a supporter of Eucharistic ecclesiology. And you can see what I mean if you read him. Uh, Father Nikolaos Ludovikos, very much alive and writing, and writing some very profound works. He critiques Metropolitan John Zizulis' position very much, so does the famous Jean Alon Darcher, a name you may know. So it's a lively discussion in Orthodox theology right now. And I'm not going to enter the discussion, sorry, but I can answer questions on it if you like. So Metropolitan John Zizulis states that when the Church gathers at the Eucharist, the Church not only, watch what he says, prays in Christ, but, wait for it, prays as Christ. You heard me correctly. He says that the Church, when the Eucharist, when the Divine Liturgy is being celebrated, is already beyond the cross, and therefore at that point, beyond asceticism. He states that all theosis, that's a word I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard before, divinization, we become what God is by nature through grace. All theosis 
occurs finally in the Eucharist. These are very strong statements. I've been watching the eyes of the clergy and those near them as I'm making these statements and dropping them, realizing um, that, that they understand, you know, how potentially about their I won't say anything more than that, other than that they're strong statements. And I guess all of us, when we read beautiful statements like this, need to be thankful for a brilliant mind, such as uh, Metropolitan John Zizulus had, has, I'm sure, still, although we are not hearing from him in the same way anymore. But at the same time, it's all right for you, and maybe even for me, to ask the question, does it accurately reflect the reality of what we're doing? Is it in harmony with everything else that we know? Does this express the core of the Orthodox tradition? Is it something new? Is it something old? These are all of the kinds of questions we want to ask. If we say, make such powerful statements about the Eucharist, perhaps we should take a step back and say, are we really there yet? That's, I think, some of the things that are appropriate to do, charitably, lovingly, respectfully, but questions that need to be asked. And then, back to asceticism, finally. Why is this important? Why should we have this discussion? What is it about asceticism that has sparked such a spirited debate among Orthodox theologians? Well, one of them is that Metropolitan John Zizulis seemed to have some difficulty making peace with fully with Orthodox monasticism. He had some criticisms of Orthodox monasticism, which I can tell you about if you like, but I wasn't going to include in my talk. But let's bring it back to us. Why is asceticism important? One reason is it engages the will. It engages the will. Nobody can make you pray. Nobody can really make you fast. Nobody can make you forgive quickly. Nobody can make you obey the commandments of Christ. You and I need to make that choice. And so asceticism, in part, not totally, is an act of the human will. And that's all right, because the human will is only healed when you use it in a godly way. You don't see a healing in your will if you only talk about it or read theological books. Secondly, there's a big discussion about communion and all its theological implications, and I don't just mean the Eucharist, I mean communion in general. And therefore, the title of Metropolitan's first well-known book in English, Being as Communion. Asceticism means that all of the communion that he describes so beautifully is received, not imposed. You are part of it. Thirdly, when we practice asceticism, spiritual disciplines, when we make choices in the spiritual life, it shows that our spiritual life is a kind of process, there's a development, and that we need to try to understand it and, and know and be guided and know how to grow in it. And we need to know how that is part of what the church does. Fourthly, asceticism shows us the need for the virtues. 
virtues have been discussed all throughout the history of Christianity. Before Christianity, the Greek philosophers discussed virtue, Aristotle, the ethics, but virtue in general, the Stoics. In the Christian understanding, we need to acquire the virtues, especially humility, if love is ever going to be really acquired. We need to talk about the virtues. And the virtues don't come without ascetic effort. Even if all of the grace of God is given to us freely, the virtues don't come without ascetic effort. Fifthly, it shows us that the Eucharist, the Divine Liturgy, and prayer ultimately take us to the same place. That not only are they compatible, not only do they belong together, not only should they never be separated, but in fact, they take us to the same place, to the same reality, to Christ in the Church. Because in the ascetic tradition of the Orthodox Church, and sometimes we don't understand what we're sitting on, standing on, the, the impact, the full weight of our inheritance, the understanding of the human person, what a human person is, is laid bare. And we see that the human being has the inner architecture, that's my expression, of the church. St. Maximus the Confessor talks about this. And we see, as Father Dimitrius Dami Roya developed so eloquently, that our prayer is a kind of inner Eucharist with the altar of the heart. And that that altar of the heart is joined with the holy table of the Eucharist into one reality. And that the inner Eucharist both joins and flows out of the divine energy that we are serving in the church together as one people. That's where I'm going to stop. And I hope I didn't get too technical. I, I, in, in general, as I was beginning, I thought, how can I talk about this at the same time, draw it back to the spiritual life? But I'm sure there were areas that were not clear. And if you would like to pose a question, I would be very open to, to answering a few questions. And Father, I don't know, is this, did they, did they come up to the front, or how was the best, uh, the, the uh, intrepid deacon is going to take care of uh, this situation? I have a question, I'm going to wait for that. Hopefully I didn't lose you during the uh, discussion.
see that the focus on the parish life that ends up coming a lot like a social life is it all what is needed and there's no, no place for asceticism. And I've always felt that, and that's the end, I'm going to end my comment with, with this and ask my question, I've always felt that uh, I succeed with working with a parishioner when I'm able to help them find a healthy balance between both. Uh, and this is, and, and my question is, what is your advice for uh, uh, clergy and lay? I'm guessing a lot of the people who are here today have interest in theology, they probably have roles, service in their churches, and active people in, in churches. What is your uh, advice on a pastoral level to address uh, the imbalance that some of our parishes and or individuals might have between uh, and focus on one of the Eucharist or the Thank you, Father. A very appropriate question. It goes right to the heart of the matter. And of course, in the Orthodox Church, it's, it's a very big question for us. C'est une question très actuelle, one would say in French, because it, we are trying to encourage people to come to the Eucharist often. So in your parish, hundreds of people come. It's very beautiful. And, and uh, in our parish, something similar. Not hundreds, <laughs> but a lot of people come. In some Orthodox parishes, very few people go to Holy Communion. So we can see that there's a, some sort of divergence of understanding. And I think you put your finger on the essential when you said, How do we help everybody enter both? Well, Metropolitan John Zazulis has a lot of very good practical observations. And one of them is he said that the parish is really the place, the locus of the spiritual life of people. And we, we, uh, we need to understand that it's the parish, it's the church. He very much insists on this. This doesn't and shouldn't be anything anti-monastic. I suppose it could be, but it absolutely shouldn't be. It doesn't need to be. Once we understand that, then we understand that we have to really take care of our parishes, that they're important. Why do I say that? Because I'll just say parenthetically that we have Orthodox churches in big Canadian cities that are closing, and they're in the downtown. Closing. It's so less than 10 people going to find liturgy in the middle of, of huge Canadian cities. That's a separate discussion, but not completely disconnected. So, down to the practicalities. We need to take the divine liturgy seriously. That means we need to pray well. And it means that we need to prepare for it. We ought not to take the liturgy casually, see it as sort of a semi-religious, semi-social event, and now that I'm at it, I might as well take communion. This is not a correct approach. We need to be absolutely intentional. We need to prepare for receiving Holy Communion. We need to be aware in the day before that we are preparing to go to Holy Communion. You know, when we were in seminary, they didn't let us go out Saturday night. It isn't just a rule, it was to try to inculcate a kind of phronema mindset where we would understand that we need to prepare. And we do need to prepare. So I realized that the parish is also a place of great fellowship. But the Divine Liturgy might not be the time for it. Divine Liturgy is the time for prayer as a people. And we need to reorient the, the attention of our people in that way. And I think explain to them how profound and how great the Eucharist is and how what exactly Christ does with us if we permit Him when we receive Holy Communion. 
sell it out. It's really quite, it's massive. I don't even know if most of our people understand the degree to which Christ can unite us to himself. Father Dimitri says, he mixes his thoughts with ours because, I hope it doesn't scandalize you. I'm not scandalized by what he says, because Christ consumes us too. It doesn't take our identity away, but unites us to him so closely that his thoughts begin to appear in our mind. Do our people really believe that? Or is that just someone who believes it because he spent a few years in prison and suffered for the faith? So we take, need to take the Eucharist seriously without at the same time scaring people away because sometimes people will not come because they haven't done, I don't know, two canons and, and you know, the two and a half hours worth of preparation out of the prayer book and you need to tell them, oh, okay, it's okay, you know. <laughs> you can just relax a little bit and, and you can do a good preparation in a way which doesn't take quite as long. Now on the other hand is prayer. We need to practice personal prayer and it's a struggle, it's hard, it's hard to pray. Sometimes very hard work. And I know that priests are always trying to help people pray, help people with a prayer rule, encourage them. And we need to do this because St. Gregory Palamas says, if you don't pray in the marketplace, you don't pray in church. I'm paraphrasing him. If you can't pray in the Agora, you can't pray in the church. So what he's saying is, if you don't have a life of prayer, the Hesychasts took seriously, the Orthodox Church took seriously, that you can pray without ceasing. And you and I have to guide our people to do it. We need to look out at all of our parishioners and say, how can I help each and every one of them pray ceaselessly? All of them, not some of them, all of them. Of course it doesn't happen overnight, and that's what asceticism is all about. If we have everybody moving in that direction, even though it's a big struggle, towards a constant memory of God, that you never forget God, when we sin, we forget God, that we're always turned towards Christ, and if at the same time we understand the miracle of divine liturgy and its impact, its greatness, its grandeur, its power, balance achieved, it's a lifetime of pastoral work for priests, for deacons, for catechists, for church school teachers, for everyone, to achieve that balance. But that's what the fathers of the church, that's what the Orthodox Church is asking of us. The Orthodox Church is not asking us to present a quaint, attractive, esoteric, Byzantine edifice or interesting mysticism to people. We're asking, fathers are asking us to bring people to Christ. And that means we need to teach people how to pray, really, and how to participate in the Eucharist seriously, but still as a whole church. So this whole thing of Orthodox Eucharistic ecclesiology begins when Orthodox theologians rediscover the reality that in the early church everyone was taking Holy Communion and doing it according to St. Basil three or four times a week. And then looked at the current reality and they began reading the whole structure of the church, theology of the church through, and through that lens. It's fantastic discovery, discovery in quotation marks. But at the same time, people need to pray. If people stop praying or stop going to the Eucharist, you lose. It's not that the church doesn't, isn't the church anymore, but you, you lose the experience of it. So it's, it's absolutely critical. And, and priests can't do it alone. So all of you who are listening to this, 
I'm going to ask you, I can only ask, suggest, I'm, I'm sure that Father Nicarius, Father Nicholas, and the deacons would all agree with me, that each and every one of you take responsibility for this. We're going to do it. It's not just one person who's going to do it, or a couple of people are going to do it. We should do it. But it's, thank you, Father, it's an important observation. And by the way, you can do a great job of it without reading my book. <laughs> yes. Father, I know that we should treat analogies carefully, but if you can provide an analogy to explain the relationship between asceticism and the Eucharist, what would you, what would you say? A marriage. Something that should never, what, what God has called together, let no man break asunder. We, we, we don't have a celebration of liturgical services without people having a true life of prayer, and we don't have a life of prayer without people being connected to the church. We have a word for that, a salmonism. It's a heresy, the latter. But when the two are joined together, and they contribute to each other, then it, in the best marriage, it's not a corporate merger. The two come together to produce something completely new and more dynamic than what they had before. And this is true here. If you marry asceticism to the Eucharist, and Eucharist to asceticism, if they're crowned together, then you you, you really see the, the dynamism of, of the church, which will show itself in mission and in ministry and in many other respects. So, 
once we receive Holy Communion, it doesn't mean that we have to be, you know, you're praying the post-communion prayers for two hours afterwards and your husband or your wife can't talk to you, you know, that's a, don't talk to me in the car, I'm praying the post-communion prayers, uh, you know, so on and so forth. And then when we get home, sweetheart, we're going to do vigil, pray vigil together for five hours or whatever. I'm not talking about that. But what I am talking about is a dangerous split between everyday life and church life that allows a person to walk out of the church and just go back to business as usual. If we're fully united to Christ, every thought needs to be in submission to Him. He's mixing His thoughts with ours. We're waiting for them. Lord, I love your thoughts. I love your thoughts. And when I hear them and when I recognize them, I want to follow all of them. I want to lose mine. It changes the way we be because, forgive me for, I'll be very practical. One of the most painful things for me as a priest is to see how the Orthodox finish Pascha with a bang. Oh, I don't have to fast anymore. And what you see and don't see on a, on a Paschal night, God have mercy on us as a people. It's all over now. Party time. And yet, in a quiet tradition in the Orthodox Church, call it non-official, for centuries people believed that on one Pascha we'll go to church and not go home, that the second coming of Christ will occur during the Pascha. So everybody needs to get dressed, lock your house and say goodbye to her. It's behind you now. And if all of us went to church to receive Holy Communion, believing that Christ was coming during the Divine Liturgy, and we were leaving it all behind us and we were joyful about it, then we would achieve what needs to be achieved by guarding the grace of God. Guarding the grace of God means that we have embraced Christ, He has embraced us, and our lives are being changed. We still have to do all the same things at my house. <laughs> I'll tell you, honestly, garbage and recycling go out Sunday night because we've collected Monday morning. That's what I'm doing Sunday evening. We all have our responsibilities. But we need to be with the Lord at the Eucharist as if we were not going home. And then the rest of life falls into place, falls into order. You still work, you still go to school, you still clean your houses, you still take care of your children, you still do all the other things, but with a completely new vision. This is guarding the grace of God. I'm giving this as an example because otherwise people bring it down to rules. How many prayers do you want me to do after communion? And uh, how am I going to pray again? so on and so forth, and we, we need to not do this, this is a rigid kind of approach, but at the same time, accept the power of what we are experiencing, what we are experiencing none of us could ever do. It's beyond human reality. We need to accept that. We bring bread and wine in a beautiful church building, to the Lord. The Lord gives them back to us as Himself. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's believable, but unbelievable from the human point of view. So, we need to teach our people this, teach our children this. You can explain it in very simple ways to children that when you receive the Lord Jesus, He never leaves you. He is with you right now. And with you and everything, with you and your thoughts, with you and what you're doing, with you when you fall asleep. 
I teach our people to stay in the context of the Eucharist. Okay, if we get worn down during the week, let's at least keep it as much as we can. And we're in, we're in, pro we're, you know, in process. We work towards it. It's not a question of feeling guilty. So a lot of it has to do with awareness and intention and a decision that we don't have two different lives. We don't have the life outside of the church and the, the life in the church. Everything belongs to God. There's no split between the sacred and the profane. No dualism. It's all one life. And that's not what people are taught in Canada. Canada people are taught you have your daily life and religion is your so-called hobby. You know, some people are into it, some people aren't. Some people prefer to play golf on Sunday morning. And some people go to church. And as long as you don't talk to anyone else about it and you make sure that the rest of your life isn't terribly affected by it, you're doing well from, I'm sorry to say, the majority of Canadian point of view. So you'll have to fight. There is, a, there is asceticism involves a struggle. This is where prayer becomes very important. You need to be able to, we all need to be at the point where that the Lord that you recognize when you pray. When you pray, you need the Lord. The Lord comes to you personally. The same Lord that you meet when you pray is the same Lord that you're going to meet at the Eucharist, but He's going to meet you in two different ways. So here, the way to change the attitude is to pray is to pray and to repent. Praying people can change their attitudes. People who are not praying will not change their attitudes. We go at them, you know, in, 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 through catechism and through other ways, but people need to pray. We, we, we need to be people of prayer. It doesn't take much for a person's life to be changed by prayer. But if we don't pray, we're starving ourselves spiritually and we will form our own attitudes about church. If we pray, then the Holy Spirit forms our attitudes and we can encounter the church in a very different way. Sometimes the priests need to help us understand that there were incorrect understandings of, of how to approach the divine energy or what is going on there. And maybe deconstruct a few wrong understandings, but really it comes through prayer and through, through repentance mostly, and that when we understand that, you know what the fathers of the church say? And goodness knows, you know, if you let all of these people loose in the Orthodox Church now, what we would be seeing. You know, we all love St. John Chrysostom. Did you ever read his sermons? They're, to say that they're blistering fire is to underestimate him. He's calling out people in his church he sees in front of them, him while he's preaching. You over there, that you are talking during the Divine Liturgy, and that gives him a message. You over there dressed that way who came to the liturgy, that's St. John Chrysostom. 
We love to have them feast days, but we might not enjoy having them around very much if they were let loose. They would certainly have a few things to say, but they would teach us about uh, these, and certainly change, change a lot of the attitudes. I was going to connect with something, I've lost my thread, that's what the last person said, but maybe it will come back to me about the connection with, with, the, uh, with the fathers. Come back to me. Divine liturgy should never be, back in the old days, televised. 
or live stream. So during the pandemic, everybody was going in and so now what? You know? And especially in Greece where where there was just the priest and maybe a psalty in church. Now what? They were not going to televise and nobody's going to see the liturgy. And he was able to deal creatively with practical questions like this. It's a beautiful thing, Eucharistic ecclesiology, but no school of thought expresses the whole thing. I think that's, that's the reality of it. There, there's always something that, that goes beyond it. Well, I think the idea of, uh, of teaching Orthodox theology in the Church is a fabulous idea. I think that, you know, in many parts of the world people are spoiled. They, they have their Orthodox faculty of theology in their city and they don't sort of have to worry about it because the, the, hopefully that faculty is active in some of the parishes. For us, we don't have an Orthodox faculty of theology here in Ottawa, but we have the means to we have the means to teach Orthodox theology, and we ought to do it in the way which is best for you. Probably, all of you need to tell us 
how best to deliver that. And I, I'm sure Father Nectarios would be happy to speak to it, but I would be very happy to, to cooperate with him in uh, that endeavor. For me, it would be the greatest joy because, you know, when you're teaching in a university environment, you have all the regulations and different things that you need to worry about. People doing their papers and getting their papers in on time. Imagine giving somebody a grade for a paper on prayer or something. How do you grade give them, you know, well, yours is a B plus, yours is an A plus for, for, for a paper on prayer. I always found it enormously difficult. So you don't have to do that here. And I, I think it would be absolutely marvelous. We did have, many years ago, this is before Father Nectarios came here, many years ago we started something like that. We had a kind of cooperation of two or three Orthodox parishes where we had a, started a short cycle of teaching, and some individual Orthodox parishes are still doing it, having a series on the fathers in their parish or other series. So you could really just put together in part what we already have and make it available to a wider Orthodox public, and maybe not just an Orthodox public as well. I think it would be wonderful to to increase the theological culture, and Orthodox people are very interested, very curious. At the same time, we have to increase the spiritual culture too, to give it a balance, a base. Father Nectarios, I'm going to let you make the call for uh, where uh, there's one more question that I could see, but. I'll let you make the comments to when we end this question. So it's really just a follow-up question from what you just said. How can we increase the spiritual culture if we prepare for a theological culture? When you study Orthodox theology, beautiful as it is, you should never let it become a manipulation of theological concepts. And when, you, when there's something that you do not understand, stop. Stop and pray. There's so much in, the, in Holy Scripture and the Fathers that is so great. I remember when I was studying St. Gregory Alamas, I was at uh, Holy Cross in Boston, and I was reading in the library one night, and I came across one of his writings in which he referred to the blood of God. And I didn't read anything more, and I just closed my book. I thought, if I can even penetrate a little bit of that tonight, it's enough. I don't want to fill my head with concepts. I want to try to understand everything he meant by the blood of God. In general, through prayer and through uh, lively, warm, spiritual discipline, not practicing asceticism in a cold way, but out of love. You know, you can, you can obey the Lord's commandments or go to church either because you're scared, I'm, if I don't do this, I'll go to hell, or because you have a promise of a reward, if I do do this, I will get a spiritual reward. Or you can do it out of love. If you do that out of love, fathers of the church call you a son or a daughter. If you do it out of promise of reward, the fathers of the church call you a mercenary. And if you do it out of fear, the fathers of the church call you a slave. So we want to practice the ascetical disciplines in practical ways. I say it can be practical because we you know fathers and father deacons, we have to unpack some of this for our people. You know, for example, they're asking us about fasting regulations which are actually need to be adapted to, to Canada. 
It's not, uh, it's not Lenten or inexpensive or simple to be, <laughs> you know, eating uh, shellfish all that and this sort of thing. And people are asking, well, does this or that contain uh, that, uh, this kind of oil? And people really need to get these to stay simple with these things and not get into these sort of technicalities. But we need to do it out of love and practice asceticism in a way that it's not burdensome, not legalistic, not rigid, very simple, joyful. And when we, when we practice asceticism and we're being formed by the services in our parish, both, we will have a very real spiritual culture. Very real. And you know what is going to be absolutely wonderful? Is it won't matter whether your church speaks mostly Greek or Arabic or Romanian or anything else. We'll all recognize it in each other and we'll come to the inevitable conclusion that I hope Orthodox ought to come to, and that is that there is one Orthodox culture, one Orthodox spiritual reality. And that will also make a big impact on the Orthodox Church in Ottawa, too, I might add. So, you raise the spiritual culture, you raise the theological culture, you see absolutely wonderful results. People who, in whom the spiritual culture is being raised are hungry for theology. They, they eat it faster than someone can give it to them and digest it. And then you don't, the, the two are married. It's a, it's a relationship of mutual benefit. So I would say let's take up the challenge collectively, corporately, as or as the uh, Orthodox Church in the city, and and uh, do what we can. You were very, very patient tonight, and uh, I again want to thank Father Nectarios for for having us here this evening. And I I, I don't want to be sound like I'm either either. If you, if you want to go home or Father Nectarius will be able to give you a little time to just exchange a few greetings with each other in the church, it's fine. If you want a book there at the, at the back, if you don't want a book, absolutely fine. I didn't tell you, I don't know if I told you at the beginning, that I seriously resisted publishing this for, for a number of reasons. I won't say all of the reasons. But I absolutely did not want to, and if it weren't for three Orthodox theologians, one of whom asked a question tonight, who pushed me lovingly, it, it wouldn't have been published. So I, it's written, and I, if someone told me I never want to read it, I would say, you're right. <laughs> just, uh, just do what the Father say. Do what the Fathers say, live the life of the Church, and you don't need a book like that. If you're interested in reading it, there it is. The only reason I'm mentioning it to you is pure, for purely practical reasons, and that is that the publisher, I just realized recently, hasn't released it yet in Canada and the United States. So there's actually no other place to get it other than here and the UK, straight from the publisher. Even though it's advertised on Amazon, they don't have the books yet. They're smiling in London and the UK saying, we have the books, we have the advertising, we have the books. So if you'd like a copy, you can uh, pick one up at the back and then if you, by the end of March or early April, it will be officially released in Canada and the US. If you really want me to sign one of them, I'll turn several shades of purple, pink, and other colors of the rainbow because I will uh, still sign them here. I just didn't want to be... If selling's going to happen, let it be in our effects, not in front of the altar. So it's back there if you want to, if you want to buy some, and if you want me to sign it, I'll wait around here. And if you don't want to buy one, you also do well. So I'll, I'll leave that with, with you this evening. 
Thank you again for having me here, and thank you all for being so supportive and coming this evening. I hope it, it generates more thought and hopefully more more prayer.